research for the past artificial intelligence. And in particular, its impact on business. And the question, of course, that we always get asked is what's its impact going to be on the workplace? I believe this is the current thing that is causing the most anxiety about artificial intelligence and automation in general. Just uh, yesterday in the New York Times was a report uh, from the World Economic Forum uh, regarding the attitudes of CEOs and basic power dealers in terms of what uh, the impact of artificial intelligence was going to be. And during the sessions, this uh, article reported, they were optimistic it was going to help improve productivity and make everybody better. But privately, they were all about how quickly can we use artificial intelligence to automate uh, and reduce the costs associated with our workforce. In other words, the thing you were worried about. Now, when you look out there on what the current impact of things like artificial intelligence are, particularly digital things, you get a mixed picture. The strongest picture that one might worry about is what comes from uh, the story of the London taxi cab drivers. London taxi cabs, unlike many others uh, around the world, uh, they're regulated, but in their case, in order to get a taxi driver's license, you have to acquire what is called the knowledge. And the knowledge is basically you going to school for two to four years to upload the entire London street map, the Great London street map, into your head. And not just that map, but also the fastest way between any two points on that map. It takes two to four years to do so. Now, as a result of that, if you took a London cab, uh, they were dramatically efficient. They knew where to go. They knew the shortest routes. They had heard of the place you wanted to go to. In fact, you might find yourself wandering around London, able surely to walk to where you wanted to go, but in the era before mobile phones, it was easier to take a cab because that's where the map was. And not surprisingly, those cab drivers, as a result of that, enjoyed some premium in terms of what the prices they were able to charge for their services. Now, like everywhere else in the world, London cab drivers are now complaining. And they're complaining because of the competition coming from unregulated platforms such as Uber, Lyft, and so on, where anybody can go and drive someone around. But you have to think about it. What did Uber do to the London cab driver? Did they come to the London cab driver and shake them down and knock them about so they started to forget the knowledge? Did they make them worse drivers? None of that. Nothing changed in terms of their abilities. But what changed is, now, and I'm going to call this in principle, any idiot could do it. And why could any idiot now drive a cab at the efficiency of a London cab driver? Because, like all idiots, we have these. And on this, for free, are software programs like Google Maps and Waze that allow you to find your way around London with ease. And so anybody who can drive now can now drive at the efficiency of a London cab driver. If this hadn't been there, if you just, if you can imagine, just that Uber, but there'd been no great maps, the London cab drivers would have been just fine because you would have been taking Ubers and it would have been a frustrating experience. What enabled it was this technology. So that is what we mean by automation coming in and devaluing the core skills that were part of someone's job. So the fear is 
it might be your core skill that's coming in there. And I don't have any particular insight on that. And you sort of hear that to you. I do a number of things for my job, but this thing is really important and goes away. Why, right on this very stage, about three or four years ago, Jeff Hinton, one of the pioneers of AI, got up and said, we should stop training radiologists now. Now, your kids are thinking of going into radiology, don't do it, he basically said. Why? Because his view of what radiologists did is, radiologists look at images and tell you what's in them. But now, artificial intelligence is able to replicate that function. It's able to tell you what is in one of these images and often can do it more efficiently than even the best trained radiologists. Now, if that's your view of what radiologists do, of course you should stop training them. Now, radiologists have faced these threats for a while, and they do a lot more than that. Some places more than others, depending on how you've organized your hospital workflows. So that's a whole open question there, whether we should stop training radiologists, but it sits there in the background. But let me give you another story to give you some sense of hope and why this is sad. If I told you that there was a major job category employing millions of people right up until the 1980s, millions, and you all knew them, you're, you, some of you may have been some, <laughs> but you all knew somebody like it, and that within 15 years they had all disappeared. And what if I told you that we don't have any songs about the lost art of this profession, of this skill. We don't have any articles studying it, talking about it, lamenting it, telling you what happened to these poor people that were wiped out by a piece of technology. We have none of it. Does that sound believable? That you can have an entire ubiquitous profession disappear in the way we're thinking about it overnight, and yet it's not going to be obvious what it is because we've never paid attention to the fact that it's gone, although when I tell you, you'll know it is. And that profession is, that profession is the typist. The typist is gone. The typist has disappeared. Again, I know of no songs about the typist. I know of no novels about the, what the typist is. I don't know for sure what happened to any given typist. But they disappeared. And why did they disappear? Well, well now, we, now we know. But the story goes, they disappeared because of the word processor. The word processor took away that key part, ta task of many people's jobs, and in particular, in some people, the actual job themselves. But how did it do this? So I think for myself right in this institution, it's before my time, so this has already happened, but for my time when I watched supervisors and, and the like, uh, professors used to have people, uh, secretaries, who would type things for them, type it in their papers, their books, what have you. And many executives and other uh, parts of organizations had the same thing. What happened to all this? Well, I'll tell you one thing's for sure. No professors anywhere near the typists that any of these typists were. No one can type. One of the ways, if you brought a typist back from the, from the, from the 1960s and had them look at how, how we're typing, it would be completely laughable. Completely laughable. We're terrible at it. We make mistakes, type terrible things, etc. So the word processor still requires typing. It last time I looked. You don't get the words onto the word processor without having typed them, every single key. Uh, and we don't jump up and down and use dictation things or anything like that, generally speaking. So that's still all happening. So what did change? What did the word processor do? It didn't make typing easier. It didn't make us better typists. Maybe the keyboards were a bit easier to use than the old typewriters and things like that and less, but you know, that's not a huge thing and we argue about them constantly still didn't do any of that. But it did do one thing. It reduced double handling. It reduced double handling. Previously, you'd have to write on paper your document, submit it to a typist, and 
the times for titles. So that's two times that is code. So surely it would be better if you could just type it yourself. That would eliminate that. But you're a bad typist, but you're also not bad at they're good at writing either. So that's a bit of a punch. No, it was again the any idiot can now do it principle. The problem is that if you attempted to type something on a typewriter and you were a bad typist, you would make mistakes. And when you make mistakes on type pages, you either have to correct them with liquid paper or some other thing like that, which is not that acceptable, right? Or you have to retype the whole page. And every time you do it, constantly. And so if you're a bad type, if you're the typist you are now, trying to type something on a typewriter, you would have to continually do it over again. But with a word processor, none of that was necessary. With a word processor, any idiot could do it. Any idiot could do it because the word processor's chief function was to allow you to easily correct human mistakes. <laughs> easily correct human mistakes. And so all of a sudden, the reason why you're a bad typist was not going to block you from getting an the double hand. And so, slowly but surely, all the people who are typists found themselves with less things to type. Now, fortunately, where did they go? Fortunately, for most of them, it turned out that typing was not just the only thing they did. They had a bundle of activities. Sometimes they do a lot of typing. Sometimes they do a lot of other things. And they'd always have other stuff that they never had time to do. And the job was over. And we'll see this occur as well, just to prep us for the next talk. We are talking now with self-driving vehicles that all of these truck drivers and employment, some of the largest employment categories in the United States, is going to be wiped out because of autonomous vehicles. But you have to ask yourself the question, is all that a truck driver does drive, or could they actually do their job better if they didn't have to drive? But if you're not thinking to win some truck driver, think about a school bus driver and whether their job would be better if they didn't have to pay attention.